Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello? Hello, could I please speak with Alex Ross? Uh, this is he. Alex, it's such a pleasure to have you on the phone. This is Paul Holdengraber calling you from the quarantine tapes. I'm, I'm really delighted that you, yep. you are part of this. I felt that your, your voice um, was very important to this series. So thank you so much for taking my call. Where does my call actually find you at this moment? Oh, uh, well, it's, uh, thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this, Paul. Um, I am in Los Angeles. Uh, I divide my time between uh, Los Angeles and New York these days. And um, the the crisis found me on the West Coast. Uh, so uh, I've been here since uh, the middle of March um, and uh, trying to keep myself reasonably sane like everyone else. Yeah, reason, reasonably sane is is a word for the moment. I, 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 I keep marveling at the fact that when I ask people uh, at times now how they are, they actually quite often pause before answering that question. It's as mm-hmm. if this moment has really heightened the stakes in such a huge way. And we, we, we don't quite know. Mm-hmm. We need to check in with ourselves as to how, how we are and what even that question might mean in these times. Yeah, the I, usual banalities don't quite suffice. No, they don't. You know, I'm fine. How are you? Is not the answer I get all the time, which is the answer one used to get all the time. So one, one might even imagine that patterns of speech and thought may, may when one is optimistic, uh, change with with this pandemic perhaps who knows yeah but i am curious about one thing um what was the last concert you attended before the lockdown uh yeah well, i remember very well it was a remarkable event uh at uh, walt disney concert hall uh in los angeles it was a recital by the young uh american pianist conrad Tao um on march 10th uh and he performed a program with a strong political slant to it. It was the uh, music of the contemporary American composer Frederick Ryszewski, uh, together with uh, Aaron Copeland, uh, who, of course, had strong uh, left-wing political commitments in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and the big piece in the program, or the final piece in the program, was Ryszewski's uh, gigantic sequence of variations on the Chilean revolutionary song, The People United Will Never Be Defeated. Mm, uh, so that mm, was mm. the last, last music I heard live. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it's amazing It's amazing how precise one can be. I mean, I'm sure in, in your line of business, you remember the date of many of the concerts, but you remember May 10th. I mean, it's it's very you know i've been speaking to a few a few people for instance linelle george remembers completely the last performance she went to at at right. ca- at cap at, at at ucla it's as if there's a watershed moment before and after and interestingly enough i was fascinated to read your new yorker piece about the last concert that the berlin philharmonic gave can you describe mm-hmm. that I, I i think it's so beautiful yeah, well, that was um, that was uh, uh, right after, and the uh, Berlin Philharmonic had rehearsed this program and proceeded to play it in the Great Philharmonie Concert Hall in Berlin without an audience. Um, and you know, immediately after that, um, uh, even these private gatherings of a uh, hundred people in the orchestra would be would be forbidden. But uh, for a few days, uh, that still went on, and it was. Uh, Simon Rattle, um, the former uh, music director of the Berlin Philharmonic, um, uh, conducting uh, Berio's Sinfonia, this great surrealistic collage, montage of musical voices uh, from all different eras, uh, and the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. And uh, it was 
there was something very powerful about it, uh, I think. Uh, and, and Simon Rattle uh, had very powerful words uh, beforehand, um, and he immediately perceived uh, what has come to be mm. uh, the case disastrously, catastrophically, that, that this shutdown would have a very severe effect on the performing arts. Um, and, and it just remains to be seen how much will survive and how things will be able to go on and, and yeah. resume in the performing arts because, uh, of course, this is the, these will be the last uh, segments of our society to reopen. Uh, this is a business that, that uh, <clears throat> consists of cramming large numbers of people into small spaces uh, uh, to witness an event together. And, and so it's, it's a, a very, very uh, tough situation lying ahead or already that we are now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly get to that. But what, what struck me is also what you write about those strong words you say in a pre-taped introduction for each piece. Rattle refused to peddle bromides about music's power to comfort and uplift, instead mm -hmm. reminding viewers of the historical darkness from which these works arose. Uh, that, historic, right. that historical darkness, now we have a, I don't know if one would call it a historical darkness, but darkness for sure. And um, so yeah. not, not, not words of, of comfort given there, not easy, cheesy words of comfort given that are so often given before concerts you know that music music will will be a balm uh, you know you you speak in such a fascinating way about your experience of listening listening and epiphanies of listening since this um pandemic have you had such experiences have you had such um epiphanies in listening yes a few um of course i've been listening uh I continue to listen as as ever to uh, recordings uh, from my my library uh, of of recordings, and uh, sometimes I think certain pieces have struck me in ways that they have not uh, before. I found mm, myself mm. entirely mm. swept away by uh, Poulenc's great um, Stabat Mater, uh, which is a, uh, a a work of a kind of Fair, uh, melancholy, mm. uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, sort of uh, modern uh, religious presence, and um, and that, that had quite an effect on me. Of course, Bach, Saint Matt, Saint Matthew, and Saint John Passion are, are works that uh, I, I like to say um, they they see every catastrophe uh, coming in advance, <laughs> no the, matter what is happening. The, we'll all, we'll, we'll always be ready. <laughs> We'll always yes. be ready, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we have yet to concoct a, a, uh, a catastrophe. Uh, well, give, we, 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 we're, we're pretty, we're a resourceful bunch. <laughs> Maybe we will, but, but for for the moment, for the moment, Bach has done. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bach has our number. Um, so, um, but then, yeah, of course, I've been spending a lot of time uh, listening online to these live streams, and yeah. this is something which which began really um, immediately after the shutdown, uh, that <clears throat> Berlin Philharmonic concert was, on the one hand, part of the, the Philharmonic's usual series of concerts that, that they put online in their digital concert hall, but of course now it had quite a different atmosphere to it. But on that same day, March 12th, and you're right, I, these, <laughs> these dates are stuck in my memory. Yeah, uh, really, the, no, yeah. Yeah, the great young German pianist Igor Levitt um, began mm -hmm. what would turn out to be 52 consecutive performances in his apartment in Berlin. Um, uh, uh, night after night, uh, he set up a very simple, very rudimentary system of uh, filming himself at the piano uh, on his iPhone and then broadcasting it out onto Twitter. Um, and he began with Beethoven's Lodstein Sonata uh, that day. And went on to to cover a, an extraordinary breadth of repertory from from very famous works by Beethoven, Schubert, uh, Liszt, and so on, uh, to obscure, arcane, magnificent uh, pieces like um, Ronald Stevens and uh, Passacaglia on DSCH, uh, uh, and he played the Rachevsky, uh, People United Variations as well, and and so it was just a, a, an extraordinary feat. 
Um, and uh, those performances uh, sometimes were were very, very striking just in terms of how a particular choice on a particular day would would sneak up on you and you could see the way he himself was was gripped and, and moved by what he was playing. So I had already been working on an article for the New Yorker about him since last summer, actually. I've been mm. periodically seeing him uh, in Europe um, and talking to him and, and watching him perform. And then the shutdown happened. And um, at first, I feared that I would no longer have an ending to my article. Um, uh, my, <laughs> on the low level of fear and anxiety. Right. But still, <laughs> but of but course, still, writers are, are but still. extremely uh, self centered What is this going to do to my piece? Um, but, uh, uh, but I needn't to worry, of course, because uh, uh, Igor, who is uh, an extraordinarily uh, alert and engaged uh, individual among classical musicians who often are not quite so alert and engaged, frankly. Uh, he, he seized upon this moment. He, he saw his own role that he could play in it. Uh, and, and so suddenly I had, well, not only the ending, but also the beginning of the piece in terms of talking about his, uh, his uh, house uh, concert, house concert in German. And, uh, and so uh, I still do regret, though, he, he had been building up to a performance of this monumental um, piano concerto by Fabrizio Bozzoni, uh, which is more than an hour long, and it also involves a male chorus singing a hymn to Allah. Uh, it's, it's, a, wow. it's, a, it's a a bizarre and extraordinary and, and, and magnificent piece. Uh, um, uh, Bozzoni was just, uh, you know, not among the most famous names in classical music, but but an absolute genius as pianist, as composer, as thinker. Um, so this was going to be his his great feat uh, of the spring playing the Bazzani Concerto in Rome. And, and, and of course, it didn't then, happen. Yeah. And, then, and, and I still wanted to talk to him about it. Yeah. Um, and it was quite striking. I, 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 I should have realized that this was maybe not the, the best avenue to pursue, but I kept sort of asking him, well, can we talk about this concerto? And, you know, we were just talking through the computer on FaceTime and so on. Um, and I just really wanted to hear it because <laughs> I love the piece. <laughs> and so he started talking about it and he started playing bits and pieces of it and, and he broke off and I suddenly realized this is, and he said something like, you know, it's, just, it's so heartbreaking. I didn't get to, to play this. I could cry. And, and I realized this was crushing for him. That something that he had uh, been working on for months and months was not going to happen. And to, to sort of <laughs> bring it up uh, uh, and force him to uh, to talk about it and to play it was, uh, of course, it was very agreeable about the whole thing. But, uh, but I realized uh, there's so many different levels of loss, you know, um, that, that people are experiencing. Uh, and just this whole idea of future plans and, and projects and, and uh, of course, much deeper uh, than that. Yeah, uh, deep. Lives and livelihoods and, and uh, uh, being destroyed, but, but no one is unaffected. And, and, and so there's all these different kinds of loss that are taking place. And, and um, you, you were mentioning before that, that Bach can come to the, to the rescue uh, in, mm -hmm. in moments of catastrophe, in moments of grief, in moments of loss. Someone else who you turn to in these moments and poignantly have written about recently is Brahms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I, I found your, your ruminations um, really, really moving where you, you, you write, he's a great poet of the ambiguous in between nameless emotions, ambient yeah. unease, pervasive wistfulness, bemused resignation, contained rage, ironic merriment, smiling through tears, almost pleasurable fatigue of deep depression. Mm -hmm. Really tremendous, Alex, I must say. And, and um, in your own journey now, Brahms has taken on a, a, a big meaning for you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. It, yeah, this, this piece came out of a loss that I experienced uh, before uh, um, uh, coronavirus really arrived in the United States. Um, uh, it's full strength, but in late February, uh, my mother, who was uh, 91, uh, died in Washington, D.C., and uh, it happened quite suddenly, although 
with a woman of that age, a yeah. person of that age, um, one, one uh, always has to be prepared in, in some way. And, and we were actually relieved that it happened at home and relatively without pain. She had been suffering from Parkinson's disease for many years. Um, but I, I had to, I learned this at 9 p.m. at night and, and got myself to uh, LAX for the last overnight flight uh, and arrived in D.C. Uh, the next day to start preparing for the funeral with my brother. And, uh, and of course, I couldn't sleep in the plane and, and I couldn't watch it. A silly movie. Uh, so I listened to Brahms. Well, late, uh, I had this playlist on my phone of the of the final works of Brahms in chronological order, uh, and it's always been my my favorite music. Uh, it certainly spoke to me in that state of grief, or it wasn't even really grief yet. It was it was it was just the shock yeah. uh, and the kind of numbness. Um, but it's music that I turned to under any circumstances, and that's what I was writing about in that piece. Uh, I was sort of suggesting that this, this is music that people could turn to who are, who are, who are experiencing the same in this, in this terrible time. But uh, going back to what you were saying earlier about the, the bromides about, you know, music being consolation and, and uh, uh, sort of uplifting us and so on. You know, music can do so many things. Right. And, and we can do so many things to with music. It, I mean, with, the relationship yeah. is very complicated. And, and a, a carefree, happy piece can have a crushing effect on us because it's some association that we have and, and, and something very tragic might have a kind of invigorating uh, effect on us. So it's, it's just a, a relationship that can't be matched. It can't be uh, explained. It's thankfully, contingent. thankfully. I mean, yeah. it, can't um, be, it can't be explained and then, you know, there's Alex Ross explaining it at certain moments. Well, um, uh, no, explaining the inexplicability. Well, yes, yes uh, uh, appro yeah, um, approximating. It's an, uh, 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 yeah. how do you call it in mathematics, an asymptote. Uh, it's reaching, trying to, and it's the, the, the space in between what you're trying to reach and the experience you've had, which you, yeah. you talk about so beautifully also in an uh, in another essay you talk about a concert you went to in 1989 where mm -hmm. which remains visceral you, you say it remains one of the most visceral listening experience of my life a concert of Cecil with Cecil Taylor and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering what what do you mean by that and are there other performances you would put in that category and what does visceral experience may mean to 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 you yes well that 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 event does certainly stick in my head it it, it was a it was a, a stage on a journey that had begun when i was in college in those years i arrived in college utterly ignorant of anything outside of classical music um and uh i somehow gotten all the way through high school without without listening to a note of, of <laughs> anything else that, uh, that uh, you know, kids my age were paying attention to, which, of course, made me tremendously popular, <laughs> as cool as you can imagine. But, um, but then I, became, I began to be educated, and friends in, in, uh, in college uh, uh, sort of found these thresholds for me. I couldn't enter just by sort of listening to the Beatles or, or Bob Dylan. You know, I had to enter through the sort of avant-garde back door. Uh, so the first jazz that I that I listened to uh, was Cecil Taylor and Ornette Coleman, and the first rock I listened to was Per Ubu and, and Sonic Youth, these, these quite dissonant uh, post-punk bands. And my friends knew that this, this would sort of catch my ear because at the time I was very into this extremely noisy, dissonant, wonderful post-war avant-garde music. Um, and so I listened to Cecil Taylor on record, and then with uh, a friend, uh, we went to uh, uh, a live show that he did with a trio in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts in 1989. And as much as I love the music on record, I was completely unprepared for the viscerality of him, you know, never mind my own experience, uh, just the titanic, uh, 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 the sort of dam bursting energy uh, of, of how he uh, attacked the piano. And I very distinctly remember this moment you know, right from the start, it was a, it was a, a frenzy of of activity, uh, and it was it was just this uh, extraordinary energy, uh, this velocity, uh, him and and uh, his um, the other members of the trio. And then after ten minutes, suddenly it started. It leapt to some entirely new plateau 
of hypervelocity and, mm. and, and hyperkinesis and, and, and how that intensification took place when it already seemed to have already reached the, 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 the maximum of, of what could be achieved was, I mean, that was what absolutely left me gasping in, in wonder, uh, just, just that, that sense of, of just kind of hyperspace, leaving the hyperspace. And, uh, you know, but this was, the experience on my part was, you know, this, 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 this could have been entirely typical of the, of the concerts that he was giving in this period. Maybe it was, maybe it was an off night, actually, maybe the next night it was, uh, it was even more intense. But for me in that moment, it was, it, it was my own leap forward. Yeah, it was, and it was my own moment of discovery. Right, and, and, it was, and, it was, the, and these memories of, of, um, of feeling at one with music, of, of feeling overwhelmed, mm -hmm. the, 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 memory mm -hmm. of, the memory of intensity, um, it can be so powerful. And I'm wondering now, you know, we're speaking on the day of the birth of Wagner. Um, uh, how how <laughs> yeah. propitious could that be? And you just <laughs> finished a, a monumental book on, on Wagner. And I'd, I'd love you to say something to our, uh, to our listeners uh, about, about Wagner, about Wagner and ca chaos, about Wagner. Wagner and these times. <laughs> yes, well, uh, he is the, the lord of chaos uh, in many ways, um, uh, a composer who has uh, found himself swept up in, the, in an unimaginable variety of, of circumstances and situations and, and, and contexts, uh, uh, in many ways has imposed himself uh, on those uh, contexts, uh, Uh, politically, uh, uh, in literature and in, in the arts and so many other ways. And so the book that I wrote, which I'm just making the very final corrections on now, um, it's called Wagnerism, uh, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. And it's a study of, of this relationship, really, uh, between, between listener and music. Mm. Uh, and the music itself is actually somewhat beside the point. Of course, there's a lot of material in the book about Wagner himself, his life, uh, his writings, uh, his the works. Um, uh, but that is, that is really not what the book is about. It is the effect that he had on principally other artists, uh, as well as politics, philosophy, and, and uh, various other aspects. But really, the heart of the relationship is, is, is how he affected other artists. Um, and it's a fascinating relationship because very often what they took from him something that, that he could not possibly have intended. Mm. Uh, and there was this, this great moment that took place in uh, January of 1860. Uh, he went to Paris uh, to give three concerts uh, uh, at the Teatro Italien. And in the audience was Charles Baudelaire. And uh, Baudelaire was, was absolutely overwhelmed by the experience. He wrote this, this fantastic letter Incredible. Uh, talking about yeah. how he penetrated by the music, how, how it just sort of completely uh, uh, kind of um, um, unmanned him <laughs> almost. His, um, his, and then his Cecil Taylor <laughs> moment. <laughs> yes. Um, and then he proceeded to start working on this great essay, Ricard Wagner and Tan was in Paris. Um, and, and yes, you know, he, Baudelaire is overwhelmed by Wagner, but also he is overwhelming, he is overpowering, he is appropriating Wagner. You know, because when he starts talking about Uh, uh, a counter-religion, a satanic religion in Tannhäuser, when he starts talking about uh, these, these dream states and, and uh, forests of symbols, you know, he is, he is uh, pulling Wagner into his own world. Uh, and there's a fascinating letter that Wagner wrote back to Baudelaire after that essay was published. And I can't honestly believe that, that, that he approved of what Baudelaire had written, but I think what so impressed him and, and what left him sort of almost helpless with gratitude, which was not a usual state of mind for him, um, was this sense that he had had such a strong effect and that he was, his work was taking on this life in another culture, another city uh, with a very different uh, artistic mind. And I think he saw there a glimpse of his immortality, uh, uh, how, how his work would, would persist. Uh, and sort of echo forward. Uh, now, there, there is, of course, a tremendously dark side to that 
experience mm. of being overwhelmed because the young Adolf Hitler right. had a very similar uh, experience as when he was a teenager. Um, and uh, it was a scene that you actually see often, it's fascinating, all these different scenes you see in literature of the fin de siècle, uh, a young person goes to see Wagner and is overwhelmed, but also has a sensation of their own power, right. their own future awakening. Um, and this is something that, that uh, 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 Willa Cather uh, depicted, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois depicted it uh, in his amazing story of the coming of John, a young black man. Uh, 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 gay people, in all different backgrounds, Jewish people. Uh, but with Hitler, of course, that, that sensation of future power uh, assumes a... a, a supremely dark and threatening form and you've written and you've written about it incredibly uh, uh, powerfully in an article about hitler and america i mean yeah. it, it, it lo i mean it looms in the background of of everything you write about it seems to me and one of the things that i'm so interested in is is you know in order to be a, a music critic i sometimes feel that alex ross needs to write about other things than music for instance he needs to write about <laughs> bristlecone pines um i i wonder if you you crave an escape from writing about just music well i think you know i just i've always been a person of many interests and uh after college i drifted into becoming a music critic without having any great plan to do so. So I sort of found myself doing it, or it found me yeah. uh, without without my having uh, envisioned it in advance. And and I don't regret it, of course, at all. It's, it, music is the, the center of my career as a writer, and my relationship with The New Yorker has enabled everything else uh, that, that, that I've done in terms of the books uh, and other kinds of work. Um, uh, and yet, I think both because I always see music entangled um, yeah. in neighboring spheres uh, and simply because I, my, I roam around and, and, and take fascination in, in uh, uh, so many different aspects of life as, as everyone does. As no one is, is completely specialized and confined. Uh, I do have, and it's really thanks to the New Yorker, a certain freedom to drift outside of my area of expertise and, and specialty uh, and to explore. Um, I've done a couple of these natural sciences Uh, essays in, in recent years I've written about um, uh, uh, 20th century history uh, and a bit of philosophy and, and, and yet it does all it does all go with that back to music in a sense. I mean when I was in the Bristlecone Pine Forest uh, in uh, 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 the White Mountains uh, in California it was often the sound or the lack of sound in the trees. Right, right. Uh, the, the absolute uh, uh, it wasn't silence It, it was it was a kind of uh, sounding emptiness, um, and which when you, is and in when you, fact yeah, exactly yeah. something that Wagner writes about right. in one of his essays. Right. He talks about this, the resounding silence of the forest. Uh, Baudelaire uh, talks about it too. So this is a very romantic idea, you know, the the uh, the, the the sound of nature at rest. And oh. I, I do think about it in those terms. And in in less romantic in a less romantic mode in in in, in closing. I want to perhaps end on a on a more dire note. Um, mm -hmm. the, the nature of this moment now. Um, you you write that an extinction event is looming over the performing arts, and it calls for a change of practices. W right. what, what are those changes that need to happen? And you speak b brilliantly about the the internet and how free it is, but also at what cost, and at what right. cost for the the orchestras, the musicians, the livelihood of, of people who, you know, have not yet made it and make their life on a daily basis and without the, without without performing or perhaps losing something, not only for the listeners, yeah. but for themselves. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know the future at all. You know, you, you sort of envision a range of scenarios from the not so bad to the, to the totally catastrophic. Uh, but, you know, it's already bad enough mm. just, Uh, as it is um, here in the in the middle of May, uh, of course, freelance musicians uh, their their livelihoods is completely ground to a halt, and they and they live from week to week and month to month on on um, on uh, um, you know payment from gigs, uh, um, and and so they're in a very dire uh, situation. But also, you know, orchestra 
you know, full-time tenured orchestra members uh, who really had it made in terms of, you know, this is, this is the, the ultimate um, uh, uh, sort of career that you can, that you can win uh, as an oboist, as a clarinetist, as, as a, as, you know, playing any instrument to, to have a position uh, in an orchestra, but their salaries have been cut. Um, the entire uh, orchestra and chorus of the Metropolitan Opera have been yeah. furloughed and aren't being paid at all. A lot of the others are being paid a portion of their uh, salaries. Uh, so, so this is, this is, this is really harsh. Um, but you know, the institutions themselves uh, are in great danger. Um, the, the finances of the classical music world have always been fragile and murky, <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, it's it it, 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 could, it could take not too much of a push um, to to send uh, a number of institutions um, into bankruptcy into extinction altogether. So, so I just don't know how it's all going to turn out. You know, in terms of what attitudes we can change. Yeah, the change you know, of practices. Of course, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, you know, all this live stream music on the internet, which I've been listening to, is great. But this is this has already been happening. We've already had this enormous shift of music online, and the expectation, really, since the Napster era, that music was just going to be free for the taking there uh, online. And you know, the answer to that was so often, well, musicians make their money touring. They don't, you know don't need money selling recordings anymore, but, but they can make it touring. Well, now the touring has ended. Uh, and now now you see you know, people in the pop world with, with no source of income whatsoever. Uh, and so I think we see the consequences of a culture of monopoly, mm. um, uh, a, a culture dominated by the, uh, by the big tech world. Mm. Uh, uh, I have, I'm very skeptical of Spotify, um, and the other streaming services because of the, the incredibly puny amounts that they that they pay to artists in terms of royalty, even just in terms of how how these these giant conglomerates seem to have taken over all of culture, all of the media. You know, there's this huge media crisis right now too. More people than ever are going on news websites, and yet people aren't making money. People are losing money because much of the ad revenue goes to Google and, and Facebook rather than to the news organization. There's no print uh, revenue, uh, advertising anymore. So it's the total crisis in the uh, media world. And this, these, these crises are coming out of the structure that we've created for ourselves, I think, in the digital era. So, so you know, in, in terms of changing practices, we need to pay, we need to invest in culture as individuals, uh, as, uh, as a society, in political terms, although of course I have very little hope of some kind of renaissance of the New Deal for the arts uh, that, that happened after the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, but you know we can, we can at least dream about it, or perhaps take uh, the first tiny steps in that direction. But um, but you know this is this is going to be very difficult uh, again because the arts will be the last, the performing arts will be the last to go back to work, uh, and it could be a year uh, or more. And I just would not be surprised if a number of very famous, very venerable uh, organizations fell by the, the wayside. I, I hope not to mention. We, we, we must hope that, that um, somehow people will also have the, the confidence of sitting next to each other. And yeah, you know, that that, so will, that will be yeah. so hard before a vaccine is, yeah. is found. I mean, there's yeah. so many, so many, I mean, so many conditions for for life to go yeah. back to not normal, yeah. not normal, not because in a in a way, normal got us into huge trouble. Yeah, no, that, well, that's the point. You know, can, you know. Of course, the hope is that we can we can return to a different kind of normal, right? And that we can we can uh, adapt certain emergency measures uh, that that have fallen into place um, uh, on our way to to building actually a more equitable uh, and a more environmentally sound uh, society. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I don't have great hopes for that uh, just because of the <laughs> political conditions but, but, we find uh, ourselves in. But, but it's, it, we can we can we can talk about it we can dream about yeah, it yeah but you know we're we're, we're at we're at a moment that. alex where I, I i wish we had more time and i wish i could talk to you now about you know if we brought um 
some of the members of the so-called Frankfurt School uh, uh, mm -hmm. to talk with us now. Um, they, they, <laughs> they, you know, what would Adorno say? What would Benjamin say? What would others say at this moment? We, we, mm -hmm. you know, Charlotte Morley spoke about shards of hope. Uh, what are the, mm -hmm. what, you know, in, in a, thinking in a utopian way about changing culture and changing society. Changing culture can only happen if, if we change society in some form or fashion. And, um, Absolutely. you know, yeah. th this is notion that maybe the, the pandemic, as Arundhati Roy says, is a portal. Um, one, one hopes, one hopes, and one hopes also that we can go back to listening, not just online. I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, watching Yo Yo Ma play, but it's, it's truly, um, at the same time that I'm enjoying it, I, I feel such a deep level of frustration. Um, right. which is I think natural I, I prefer the yeah. real I prefer the real McCoy whoever McCoy was you know right yes well there's the social psychological element just to enjoying something in, in a group uh, in a space but also there's just so much information lost uh, just in purely physical terms you know in terms of the sounds uh, the resonances the way instruments right uh, uh, reverberate in a room uh, you just can't capture that um, no technology exists to capture the fullness uh, of that harmony to <laughs> adapt a phrase from Thomas Mann, yeah. whom we yeah, can also exactly. talk about. <laughs> we, might, we might actually say, thankfully so. Uh, th <laughs> thank thank thankfully, it can't be captured uh, through technical exactly. means. You yeah. know. Alex, it's been yeah. such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I give you a virtual hug. I hope that I'll be able to to see you in person before long. And um, and Absolutely. thank thank you so much. And I'm so looking forward to to reading your your book uh, Wagnerism uh, as soon as it comes out. When is it coming out? Uh, September fifteenth. September fifteenth. All the best to you, and thank you so much for taking our call, and be well and stay safe. Thank you, Paul. This was wonderful. Bye-bye. It really bye -bye. was. Bye-bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com slash support. 